there, there will be no prizes for the panelists, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> that would be a unique spin on a conference. Anyway, um, so we, we have four speakers who are going to be talking about educational programs for cultural competence. So from the University of Missouri, Dr. Denise Atkins, who is a associate professor and also president of Reforma. We have Dr. Mega Subramaniam from the University of Maryland, an assistant professor and co-director of the Information Policy and Access Center, as well as one of the co-chairs of this conference. We have um, Amani Ayad, who I, I'm not going to get this acronym right, I'm afraid, but runs the University of Illinois' LAMP program, which is LIS Access in the Midwest. Program. Okay. <laughs> I tried really hard to memorize it, but I... I um, and we also have uh, Dr. Julie Park from the College of Education here at the University of Maryland, who's going to offer a outside perspective from, you know, we've got three LIS perspectives and one more global. So, are, are we ready? Uh, we are nearly Excellent. So, who's ever first, come on down. Hi there, good morning everyone. Um, so we have some girl power going on here. Um, so um, Julie Park is going to begin the discussion for this panel on designing educational pre programs to prepare culturally competent graduates. Uh, she's going to present a higher education student affairs perspective of cultural competency. Uh, this will be followed by Denise Atkins' presentation on teaching diversity in the heartland Missouri where she's going to talk about her experience teaching diversity and teaching the importance of diversity to non-diverse set of students. Um, Amani Ayat then will share an example of a diversity-focused <coughs> program funded by IMLS, the LIS Access Midwest program. And then finally, I'll be sharing the information and diverse population specialization. Julie will begin. Uh, Julie will have to leave uh, immediately after her presentation. So. Uh, if there are any questions for Julie, we'll do it right after that. But for the interest of time, then we'll continue with Denise's presentation, Amani, and then mine. And then at the end, we'll take questions. So Julie, welcome. Thank you, Mega. I have to confess, when Paul invited me to participate in this symposium, I said, I know very little about LIS, even though at UCLA, where I did my graduate work, the College of Education was actually combined with IS, but we didn't always collaborate so much. Um, but he said, that's great. We need someone to come from the outside who's actually not in our field to talk a little bit about how um, other fields are handling diversity, working with diversity. And I said, OK, I can do that. I can talk about my own field. Um, but before I go into talking specifically about how our student affairs program in the College of Education has um, addressed issues of diversity and inclusion, I'm going to give a, actually a nice continuation of the last presentation, um, talking a little bit more about the landscape of higher education writ large and our um, undergraduate and graduate student populations um, before talking specifically about the field of student affairs. Clicker. It's a, uh, okay. You have it. Okay, thanks. So just a little bit of the context, I'm sure this has already been said. Um, our country continues to diversify at an unprecedented rate. And amazingly, um, much of this growth comes from communities of color. Um, more than half of the country's growth in the past decade was due to growth just in the Hispanic Latino population. And communities of color were young. Um, a lot of this growth has come from simply the increase in birth rates. Um, so certainly as we think about the future college populations, um, they're going to only continue to diversify in terms of race, ethnicity. Reflecting that, William Frey at the Brookings Institute wrote in a census report, the engine of growth for the younger population in most states will be new minorities or minority majorities in some states. So how is this affecting higher education? Well, we're seeing, in particular, growing enrollments, especially from Asian American and Latino Latina populations. Um, most recently, it was found that actually the only group where enrolling, enrollment is actually decreasing is within white students. Minority serving institutions, so historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, 
Asian American Pacific Islander serving institutions, a recent addition, and tribal colleges will continue to play a major role in um, educating a large proportion of um, students of color. However, we know that we can no longer call them predominantly white institutions at traditionally white institutions um, are also um, encountering unprecedented, <coughs> unprecedented diversity as well. However, despite the overall big picture growth in enrollment from students of color, we see many challenges. Um, higher education as a system writ large continues to be stratified by both race and class. Um, there's disproportionate representation, um, especially among um, Black and Latino and Asian American populations. They're more likely to be concentrated in the community college system. Um, and also, um, there are many challenges that they encounter once they actually get to campus. Um, rising costs, challenges to financial aid, and then also issues with retention and graduation, where communities of color are less likely to graduate within a four to six year range in the undergraduate um, level. And then also, our communities are diverse in and of themselves. So within Latinos, you have tremendous diversity depending on socioeconomic status, gender, um, first generation, college status, etc. Um, my own community, Asian Americans, were often spoken of as a bimodal population, where you kind of have a hump that's doing really well and a hump that is facing um, significant challenges. And even the ones who are doing well are facing challenges. So how has higher education responded? Um, I don't have to, my homework has already been done for me by the last presentation, but certainly um, trying to work to diversify the curriculum, the role of students, what is often called on campuses, student support service and student affairs, so the units that support students, especially outside of the classroom, um, working to um, initiate programs and um, opportunities for students really to have, not just interact across race, but interact in a positive manner. So a question of, okay, you have a diverse student body, um, what do you do with that? Do you just expect that they can all just be happy together or do you actually have to do something to get them interacting and talking? And then also um, opportunities for interracial friendship. Apologize, I have a sort of little nursing. And then certainly diversifying um, leadership on all levels from the professoriate, student affairs, and then senior level administration. Um, so while certainly the student population has diversified at a tremendous rate, um, the higher you go up the food chain, you don't see as many faces of color. <laughs> so one concept that I thought might be helpful to um, people in the LIS community is a framework that's often used in higher education, which is when, how we think about how a university is doing, um, what type of campus climate, campus racial climate are they, are they nurturing. Oftentimes when diversity is talked about within universities, sort of the go-to thing is to look at the numbers. Well, what percentage students of color are there? Oh, it's high. Well, they must be doing all right. Um, while the framework recognizes that structural diversity, which is the term often used to look at percentage of students of color or the racial heterogeneity of the student population, is certainly essential. It's an essential precondition. You can't have students of different races interacting if you don't have students of other races to begin with. A statement of the obvious, but someone actually had to go and prove that. Um, so while structural diversity is essential, it's a necessary but insufficient condition to know whether a campus, how a campus is doing. So some of the other um, major things that have been highlighted for researchers are understanding the historical legacy of the institution around issues of race and other social identities. Um, and how is an institution dealing with it? Do they just stuff it under the table? Or are they honest and say, hey, we've had a problem, and this is what we need to do to address it? There's the behavioral dimension of the campus racial climate, which encompasses um, both intergroup relations, so whether students of different races and ethnicities are interacting with each other, and then also intra-group relations, um, because it doesn't have to be just one or the other. You only interact with people who are different from you, or you only interact with people who are the same from you. And we see, especially for students of color, um, they tend, and white students, to reap the maximum ed educational benefits. They need a combination of both. Um, so cross-racial interaction, and then also having time to be with people who are like you and have some time just to breathe. And then lastly, the psychological perceptions of the campus racial climate. How are people just perceiving things? What's kind of the informal word in terms of 
um, how people think about this campus, um, the psychological strain that students of color might encounter from being one of very few students of color in their major, perhaps. So all of these things, while they can be applied to the broader university setting, can be applied, I think, to smaller units, so an academic program or the department, thinking about, for instance, um, LIS's own historical legacy with issues of um, oppression, injustice, inequality, et cetera. And how does that get, is it talked about or is it just assumed, oh, we're post-racial, so everything must be okay? I can say these things because I'm just giving this presentation and then I'm gonna leave. But <laughs> 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 I just drop some. <laughs> so in terms of um, the higher education research and policy community, while I feel like we're, our presentations are just tag teaming with each other, but we didn't plan this, um, thinking about shifting the attention, well, access certainly still needs attention because goodness knows the K-12 pipeline has not, yeah, has a lot of issues. But once again, we need to do two things at once, which sometimes is hard for universities to do. So from just thinking about are they here to thinking about how are they actually faring once they get here? Do we see equitable outcomes? Is there a problem if we have certain majors that um, are look very different in terms of the racial ethnic composition or gender composition from other majors? Um, how are students of different social classes faring? Do students feel a sense of belonging? Do they feel um, that this is a place that they can really belong to. So really shifting the discussion from not just access, but to access and equity. So student affairs, who are we? What do we do? I think we're, we exist. If you're at a university campus, we're there, but you might not know we're there. Um, student affairs is the umbrella term that's usually referred to. Um, they're the people who we seek to facilitate college student learning both inside and outside of the classroom. Um, traditionally, it's probably been a bigger focus on outside of the classroom, so supporting everything from residential life to diversity affairs to fraternity and sorority life. So all of these students do when they're not in class with us um, that also challenges them to think about um, the world around them, to grow in leadership, to grow um, in the ways that they make meaning, etc. cetera. Um, and student affairs plays a critical role in supporting a student body from entry to graduation. Our graduates are the ones who sit with undergrads at three in the morning in a residence hall when they're trying to ponder the meaning of life and whether this is the right place for them. Um, and all of those small moments actually add up to whether a student might feel, do I really belong at this campus? Am I satisfied? Um, do I feel like I'm torn between my home community and my institution, and oftentimes our graduates are the ones um, who are working with undergrads and graduate students to help them process these conversations, who initiate programs um, to help students talk about these things, and then also, um, yeah, just to grow. So certainly, if student affairs educators are carrying a huge load in supporting undergraduates um, and graduate students, there's, and the college student population is only continuing to diversify, it's absolutely essential that when we have, um, when we're preparing student affairs um, masters and PhD graduates, that they need to be able to receive an education that prepares them to support the very complex needs of diverse student bodies. So what do we do here at Maryland? So our program at Maryland is over 50 years old. Um, it's highly regarded um, nationwide. And amazingly, after just one year, this is my second year as an assistant professor, and I am the senior continuing member of my unit because we had some retirements and some people switched institutions. And so I'm the boss, no. <laughs> I also don't have to hear, isn't that so, so we came in and we had big shoes to fill. Um, our program is known for traditional strengths in things like student development theory, leadership, and administration. And it just happened, we didn't really plan this, um, but in terms of the new faculty who came, all of us study in one way or another communities of color. Um, we all study opportunity, equity, access, stratification from different methodological lenses. We study different populations, but it's really fun because there's a lot of intersection, or at least we get and respect each other's work. Um, Another thing within student affairs is how the field has 
developed. Um, its origins, it's an interdisciplinary field like at LIS, but um, its origins draw heavily from developmental psychology. And so there's a very heavy emphasis on the individual and how's the individual making meaning of the world around them and how are they progressing to all of these different levels of development. Well, for us three scholars of color, it was a no-brainer that there's a whole lot more that affects an individual than just their inner angst, right? You have to take into account social structures and institutions and other things. And so it's been interesting as we've sought to kind of adjust the way we have conversations in our program where, yes, we're concerned about development and individuals, but we're also thinking about populations and some of the broader structural dimensions that haven't always been emphasized in our field. So one question, <coughs> perennial question in the field is, how do you bring diversity into the curriculum? Do you do it through a course? Do you try to do it everywhere? And we said, why not do both? Um, so on one hand, we kept courses. Um, I teach one of them um, that are sort of known as a diversity course. So for our master's students, that's their multicultural practice course and um, courses that are on race, class, and gender, and social justice that are required um, for all of our graduate students. At the same time, just by virtue of who we are, we can't not talk about these issues. We, even if we tried, I think we couldn't talk about them. So it's interesting how issues of race and diversity and identity have been integrated throughout all the courses. I also teach research design. When I'm talking about how you measure a variable, I'll use examples from, you know, for instance, the census or um, how you measure a construct, et cetera. I've taught statistics um, and most of my examples have come from research on racial and ethnic diversity. Um, I'm teaching another philosophies of research class next semester. Um, for me, they're just natural connections. Everywhere I go, I see, of course, we can use these pieces, some of the debates within the broader literature on um, diversity and inclusion to help students understand these concepts. Um, so it's not just the diversity course. It's kind of the bread and butter that cuts across. And I realize for some faculty this might be very natural and easy, and for others it might take more work or more intentionality, um, but it, it certainly can be done. And so I encourage for those who are coming from other academic departments where the connections don't seem as obvious, you know, to try to partner with awesome colleagues like Mega et al. Buy her lunch um, and say, here's my syllabus. No, I don't want too many requests. But yeah, talk to people and figure out how could you know any course really be taught with bringing these issues to the forefront. It doesn't have to be in the 15th week. And then also, more broadly, thinking about concepts of organizational culture, what are the values and norms and assumptions within your program, and what is considered normal. And we want this to be the new normal for us. So the role of faculty, how am I doing on time? Okay, wrapping it up. So we have three faculty of color, we work with students, we, we do some lecture, but a lot of it is very discussion based, so we see the philosophy as co-constructing knowledge. Um, I wear one hat as expert, but I also wear another hat as learner to show that we're all on this journey together. And part of the process is helping students move from seeing social justice as just this obligation or something that's being externally imposed on them to helping them develop an internal value for it. Um, so if you have any spare time in reading, you, there might be resources in student development theory that might be helpful um, that help people understand how um, students process information and how they, it might make sense why a first year student, all of this stuff seems foreign to them because it really is. So some of the things that I've talked about, um, they may be tools that are helpful to LIS, um, I hope, and certainly, um, yeah, you can Google me. I'm open to email and discussions, and yeah, that's it.
Yeah, we face similar challenges. I think most academic departments or colleges do in one way or another. And so um, certainly there have been initiatives from our professional associations writ large to sponsor fellowships. So for instance, NASPA is one of the big student affairs organizations. And they have, it used to be called MUF, Minority Undergraduate Fellowship Program. Now they've changed the name a little bit to specifically create a pipeline for undergrads um, undergrads of color and from other minority identities um, to be to receive special mentoring um, to consider applying to our graduate programs. Um, there have been some other initiatives too, but um, certainly we it is a challenge. I taught at a different institution here at Maryland. It's actually not too difficult. I actually chair our admissions, and so we we have such a rich applicant pool that um, yeah, our cohort is half students of color, maybe a little more. Um, yeah, actually more. Actually, no, we only have two white students in the master's cohort. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't stop there. They're demographically complex and all that they bring. Um, but yeah, I have been at other institutions that have really struggled to um, attract a diverse um, student body. And so it does take a lot of intentionality, I think, at the recruitment phase. Um, I don't know if there are any initiatives within LIS to partner with minority serving institutions, HBCUs and HSIs and other um, institutions. That might be something to look into. Um, there are certainly, and part of it is awareness, I'm guessing, because like student affairs, I'm guessing not a lot of people think, oh, I want to grow up and apply to LIS graduate school. They might think like librarian or something, but this concept in itself might be foreign to them, and so I think you have to do a lot of um, educating and programming and um, potential intentional recruitment at the undergraduate level. So for instance, partnering with um, student centers that serve students of color, maybe having an information night, um, and yeah, just a lot of times it's one-on-one -on -one chasing down students and say, hey, I met you at this conference, you seem great, apply to our PhD program. So yeah, <laughs> not chase, chase. <laughs> So you can 
can see right away, I mean, yeah, we're in the Midwest. We don't have a whole lot of diversity, but we've got more diversity than that. So clearly, we have a problem that we need to deal with in terms of recruitment, but we also have a problem in that the people in our program are going to be white women, and we're going to have to train them to work in a world that is increasingly not going to be white, and probably 50% not going to be women. <laughs> okay. we, have, we actually serve five locations. We serve Columbia and Mid-Missouri, Springfield, Missouri, Kansas City, St. Louis, and Omaha. And I will put some demographic figures down there. You can see that some places, Columbia, Missouri, and Springfield, Missouri, are not too diverse. Other places are getting more diverse. Now, St. Louis, that's deceptive. This is only St. Louis the city. So if you were to count St. Louis the, and the surrounding metro area, it would look a lot whiter than that. That's because of white flight during the 1960s and 1970s when they built a great new county on the edge of St. Louis County and they made it very expensive to live in. So yeah, St. Louis is actually not the St. Louis metro area is not as diverse as that. But there is a big increase in Hispanic populations across the state <coughs> and in Omaha. Um, kind of an increase in foreign-born population. And the black population is growing pretty rapidly as well. <coughs> Okay, I've mentioned our LIS students are not located in Columbia, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about our university anyway. We have, we're the blue speck in the middle of a red state. We have a very supportive environment, but we have very little diversity. We were excited about record minority enrollment this year. Our total student enrollment was 33,805 students. Of those, a record number, 6.7% were black. Oh my goodness, it, it was amazing to us. But it's not incredibly successful. If you look back here at these, whoops, now I've done it, at these figures, whoops, these figures, 6.7 is nothing. We're better than Springfield, but not very much. <laughs> But we're, we like to think of ourselves as pretty progressive. Um, so we've done things like a campus climate survey that revealed that most of the students on our campus don't actually experience racial prejudice. They experience sexual harassment. That's because they're all white. Um, we've had two major incidents on campus, major racial incidents. And I take this from the perspective of, oh my goodness, I have a colleague in special education who says, this is a sign of progress. When people resist change, that means they're dealing with it and they're going to integrate it next. So we had a couple of racial incidents in 2010, 2011. The campus came together. The League of Black Collegians actually held a rally. And so maybe this is our opportunity to embrace change and embrace the struggle that that changing will bring to us. We also have a Chancellor's Diversity Initiative that holds diversity conferences every year. We've just had our second and this year's theme was civility. Okay, now I'm going to get back to my teaching goals. As a faculty member with a strong commitment to diversity, I came into the college as the check-the-box token person who deals with minority issues. So I came in and I said, well, this is hardly appropriate. I thought diversity should be embedded in the curriculum, and I don't do it in week 15, I do it in week 4, sometimes week 3, because I want them to build off of that knowledge so that they can go on to do stuff with it. So around week three or four, I, in my non-diversity classes, introduced the topic of, hey, there are other people out there in your communities. What should you be doing to serve them? 
Then I asked them to do community analyses, who is in your community, and outreach projects. Now, because we're a distance program primarily, we don't have that interpersonal con we don't have interpersonal interaction, so that limits students' abilities to absorb any sort of diversity training that they might get. If they're not exposed to people who are diverse, they're not going to learn about it from schoolwork. They're not going to, book learning is not like, like actual real learning. Okay. So then we came up with a diversity course. I didn't come up with it. I actually was teaching six courses at the time. Not all at once, thank goodness. But my schedule was full up. We came up with a diversity course. The woman who taught it one semester left. She left us for better ground elsewhere. And so here I am. I'm like, well, I'll do a diversity course. I've always wanted to teach a diversity course. But she left no syllabus golden opportunity for me to teach what I want to teach. <laughs> so I looked at, you can barely see, this is the Framework of Cultural Competency by Patricia, Patricia Montiel Oral. That's not how she pronounces her name, that's how I pronounce it. <laughs> um, and she has this framework. And I said to myself, OK, well, I know students are being exposed in the cognitive domain. I'm telling them what they need to know about populations of color, um, populations with disabilities. I know that they're there. What else can I add? I want to walk away from the microphone, sorry. Well, one of the things that I am adding is the interpersonal domain. We don't have enough contact with, when I say we, I mean the University of Missouri and I mean our students. We don't have enough contact with <coughs> Populate, diverse populations to actually know what they need. So uh, I sent a message out to listservs across the country saying, hey, librarians of color, I'd love it if my students could interview you. And I've had great response. People are happy to talk about what they do. I've also sent messages to the Chancellor's Diversity Initiative at our school saying, hey, um, I know there are organizations or student diversity organizations. We've got a disabled student advocacy group, the League of Black Collegians, a new Hispanic American leadership organization. Can I get these people to, in, to, to talk with my students so that we make those connections? We actually develop relationships so that my <coughs> little white students see that, hey, people are there, they're different, that's not bad, it's actually good, we have to work together. Because one of the things I don't want to do, and I try and keep an eye on this, I don't want to create a generation of great white saviors. I don't want a bunch of my students going out saying, well, here's, here's us and here's these poor other people who lack whatever we have, and I'm going to save them. No, I don't want that. I want them to say, hey, this is not a subtractive model, it's an additive model. I learn from them, they learn from me, just as you were saying. Okay, and the environmental domain. Now, there's a little bit of what I'm doing here. I, libraries are, depending on which philosopher you read, a product of the white middle class. And there are some libraries that are very, very pro-diversity, some libraries that are less so. So what I want my students to do is to actually look at library collections and see if they can find evidence of bias or evidence of a lack of inclusion. I also, I just stole this idea from Jonathan. Maybe I'll have them look at library websites and figure out what's accessible and what's not, because I know we just put a bunch of money into making our websites accessible, our public library websites. Um, another way that I'm going to have them look at institutional bias is to read the trip. I'm going to have them interview librarians of color, produce transcripts, and read a bunch of those transcripts. Probably not like 40, but maybe 10. And identify themes and figure out what sorts of 
what sorts of issues are at play when people of color come into libraries as employees? Can they get up to the higher ranks? Um, are they put in charge of all the diversity issues? Because of course you must know everything. Now, what's going on there? And actually, that is, that is my time, and those are the end of my notes. But I will be continuing over there, taking a lot of other notes and figuring out which of these things I can use for my class next semester. <laughs> for the Graduate School of Library Information Science in Illinois. And like Denise, well, uh, I am from the Midwest where it's very flat and where things around me, it's, it's corn everywhere. So I'm thrilled, <laughs> <laughs> just really thrilled to be here and I'm delighted uh, to be attending this uh, first symposium uh, and expanding uh, networks across states and regions. Um, it seems that all of us attending this gathering of minds and hearts uh, have concerns and are engaged in some way or another with uh, diversity to develop, design, and deliver programs that are uh, inclusive in nature, whether they are educational or in libraries, um, and, and programs that revolve around underrepresentation in our field, which is a big concern. Uh, as you very well uh, know. Um, I want to capture some of the work that is, uh, has been done <coughs> over the Midwest through the eyes of the LAMP program that I have been coordinating for the past uh, six years. So uh, LIS Access Midwest program uh, started in 2006 uh, with, because of that concern in the field. So the, the initiative came from uh, Gislis, the, the library school in Illinois, to invite uh, administrators from schools, <coughs> both schools and libraries to come together and try to find a solution and how to move forward and to bring more creative ideas and designing a program that would benefit everybody where resources are pulled together and where people can uh, communicate across campuses with similar concerns. Um, so in, in, in the early uh, stage and uh, life of the program, it was thought that uh, schools would be able to budget for uh, someone to be in charge of a program that brings in diverse students for recruitment and retention of students. Unfortunately, because of how you know universities work and how budgets are tight, this was not possible. So the second best thing to do at the time was to write uh, a grant and through the, the IMLS. And so LIS Access or Library Access Midwest program at the time was created and uh, to work bet between libraries and uh, schools to recruit students uh, of color and students from underrepresented uh, groups. Um, when this group met in 2006 uh, and, and, and wrote that program, the LAMP program was uh, des designed to focus on recruitment and retain students uh, from undergraduate and newly graduated students uh, and, and bring them in through the, a comprehensive program that is not only a recruitment and retention program, but rather a program that would uh, benefit those, these students educationally, engage them, create a sense of community, and make them move on into productive and uh, leadership positions in uh, the library field. So the libraries came in, especially because they have student workers who come into the libraries. That was our thought at the time, is that when they come in, 
uh, that we, we are going to recruit from those students from the, the academic libraries and that our students will be working in academic libraries as they uh, graduate. So to do that, we looked at several successful initiatives that were already in place. So we did some research about what's going on uh, to create that model. So we looked at the ALA spectrum, the uh, Association for Research Libraries initiatives for diversity, uh, for a diverse workforce. We looked at Knowledge River from Arizona. And we also looked at several of the research in the field about what's happening. Uh, in this field and why students are not coming in and where to pull students into that uh, field. We looked at the prof professional and research uh, literature and the statistics, statistical reports from Elise and um, the diversity counts from ALA on uh, what's happening and where those students are uh, coming from basically is, is what we did before we finalized uh, the the proposal. So the, the, the alliance was created and we have approximately take or give uh, um, several schools that have library schools plus academic uh, libraries. We also have what we call collaborators and those collaborators would engage with us sometimes once uh, by providing some sponsorship dur during uh, some of our events, like uh, the Paul University, or would open their uh, schools and um, for events for recruitment for us. So that's that's how we and and they they come and go according to how budgets are uh, available. So if an academic library has come in and is providing us with internships for our students, and then the following year there is no money for that internship, that academic library is not engaged during that time, but may come back again. So for example, the University of Chicago for the past two years could not do that. This year we have commitment for them that they are going to take some of our students uh, for internships, and we'd like to provide paid internships, basically. Uh, so the partners in the initiatives depend on the concerted efforts to attract and cultivate the new generation of LIS professionals. This method of collective outreach and sharing of expertise and educational resources offers a variable mean to, ra to raise the profile of LIS and enables us for positive uh, change, basically. The approach is based on a student-centered approach. So after looking at all the research, then we have students who come into the program. And so we hear from them, we survey every time. We have, we have a, an annual summer institute where after the institute we, sur we, we survey the students and listen to what they are telling us and are very flexible in changing that model to fit what the students' ideas are for that model. Uh, we promote scholars' development, so part of what we do is the summer institute, an annual summer institute that is hosted at one of our uh, partner schools. And um, before students come, we have a questionnaire that we send them out to find out where their interests are lying. Then we team them up with a mentor, and in many times that mentor is able to come and attend the institute. And so that would be the first face-to-face -face, uh, meeting with, with their mentors. And that relationship continues with them through graduate school and uh, beyond. So um, it, it's a very important part in our uh, program. Uh, we also provide a lot of opportunities for engagement and for leadership. So our students are encouraged highly to participate in regional and in um, national forums, events. And, um, and also, we engage them, as I mentioned, for um, experience and, and, and uh, gaining some basic skills in librarianship through internships. So um, when students come in in the summer, 
they can intern for two weeks in one of the academic libraries that are part of uh, the LAMP uh, Alliance. Uh, so we provide them, and once they, some of our students come as juniors, some come as seniors. So if they are a junior and they are staying with us, once they get into library information science, the grant is able to provide a scholarship for those students. We also work very closely with our partners to make sure that there, there's other support from the schools themselves. So the University of Illinois, for example, has been providing waivers for our students. It's not a given, but up till now we have had 100% uh, waiver, uh, waiving up tuition uh, for our scholars, which helps a great deal because if you look at some of the data, one of the most concerns of students of color is that how are they going to pay for their education? And having that financial um, worry uh, taken care of is a very big part of how they continue on and how they succeed in uh, graduate school. We also tap into a lot of resources that our uh, partners have. So instead of only having one uh, campus with certain resources, we have five or six other campuses with different resources. So uh, I remember yesterday, um, Sandra Hassel talked about the, the Children's uh, Book Center in Madison. Madison is one of our partners, and two of our scholars have worked in outreach uh, projects for Madison in the Children's Center. We also have currently a student at Illinois who is working for the CCB, which is the Children's Center for Books. Um, we have, the, through the new digital initiative uh, and the new uh, digital inclusion center at Illinois, which we, there was a lot of talk about broadband. We have the UC2B, which is the Urbana Champaign to Broadband. And this is administered by uh, one of our professors at uh, Gislis. Um, and we have students who are working as graduate assistants from the LAMP program with that project. So we tap into all those resources that we all have and provide a richer, uh, more rounded experience for our students. But uh, we also have, um, I'm very excited about the TLAMP project. One of our very <coughs> old scholars who, worked, who was uh, from Madison, Wisconsin, wrote a grant uh, to IMLS for the Tribal um, Libraries, Archives, and Museum project where he's working with Red Cliff uh, Indian Tribe in the northern Wisconsin area. And not only he has graduated two years ago, not only is he working on that project, but he also brings in other scholars from Milwaukee and from other parts to go and attend and participate in that uh, project. Uh, and so that brings me to some of the cultural competencies that are brought into uh, the education process and the academic education process through projects like LAMP. So how, how does this affect and how does this change the face of what we're doing? Well, uh, with our students being very much engaged and involved in, in the program and beyond, uh, it has made some of the schools look back into their curriculum. What are they teaching now? And look at their syllabus, review that syllabus, review the course descriptions, add new courses. Uh, Omar Puller, who is the TLAM uh, project coordinator in Madison, while he was a student, thought of the idea of writing a course on how to teach about Native American libraries and worked with Louise Robbins, who was the director of uh, the program at the time, and two other students to create a course that is now being taught in uh, Madison. Uh, also, our students take uh, courses through uh, programs like WISE, where they can all uh, be together. And um, I just want to leave you in the end with uh, 
some quotes from uh, our students. Um, some have already finished uh, their degree and received their degree. Some are still there, like Miguel, uh, who started in 2010, who was a junior, and he did not he was not sure at all of continuing with this profession and said he's going to take some time off. And he did take a semester off through, uh, but then we were able to provide uh, an internship at Ohio through their digital initiative. When he did that internship, it, it made him really realize that this is what I want to do and came back and he is now at the Graduate School of Library Information Science in Illinois, his first semester. Um, and Madeline Sheldon took another uh, internship also in Ohio and is now in Michigan. So we're very proud of our accomplishments and how this is affecting the face in, of LIS and how this is bringing in some change. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Mega Spramanian. I'm an assistant professor at the high school and I realized that I'm between the lunch. Uh, so <laughs> I am not an ABCD. If you were here yesterday for Sandra's presentation, so but I'm from Malaysia. Malaysians talk fast, so I think I can be done. So um, I'm going to talk about the information and diverse population specialization uh, at the College of Information Studies. I actually teach in the school library specialization and also the information and diverse population specialization. As you can see, it's a mouthful. So our students came with a very fond uh, acronym, IDP. IDP specialization is how I'm going to refer to the specialization today in my uh, presentation. I was fortunate when I first came to the college in fall 2009, uh, Paul Yeager and John Bateau has already came, came up with this idea and have already done all the hard work of uh, <laughs> conceptualizing how this program is going to take place. Uh, I came on the right time. Um, so <laughs> then, uh, but they found ways to give me work. So they included me in this IMLS proposal that we had put together, where I actually contributed in several aspects that um, was uh, unique in some way. And I'm going to share that with you as well. Um, right now, uh, we have about 21 IDP uh, scholars from uh, who were awarded uh, this IMLS scholarship. And IDP scholars, can you make some sound? Woo -woo! Woo -woo! Okay, at least I know they are they are awake. So um, uh, if you can, uh, if you have time during lunch, do ask them about the program. They all wear the badge with IDP scholars on them. Um, so, um, just let's see if I can move this. Okay. All right. So, the goals of the IDP specialization actually, there's many sub goals as you can see on the screen, but primarily uh, we are interested in um, instruction about and research into the design, development, provision, and integration of information services, information programs resources, technologies, and outreach to diverse population. Uh, we were here, some of you were here yesterday, and even today, Kumia mentioned, uh, we uh, define diversity uh, very broadly here in the college and in the university. So we look at uh, populations that, of course, uh, within the race, ethnicity, gender, disability, but it goes beyond that. We look at uh, people with um, cognitive disabilities, we look at uh, people who have different se uh, sexual orientation, and also language, literacy, national uh, origin, and all that. So uh, our students actually learn how to serve all this population, or as many as they can, in the courses that we offer. So right now, uh, we have about 75 students in the program. Uh, 
This is a pretty impressive number given that the program has only been around for three years. I think Paul Yeager mentioned this yesterday in the opening of the symposium. Uh, this is out of 257 uh, MLS students, so that's like one third. So I think we're doing pretty well in terms of getting students who are interested in the specialization. Uh, some of our students actually specialize uh, dual, have dual specialization. They specialize in school libraries, uh, primarily school libraries and archive, I think, and then also IDP. But our students broadly, they have, res uh, they have interest in working with research libraries, public libraries, special libraries, um, also um, government organizations. So it's pretty diversified in terms of where or the context of information institutions that they would like to work with. Uh, I just want to give you an overview of what we actually do in the program. Um, so we basically, uh, our, our students take the uh, entire MLS, um, um, Masters in Library Information, Masters in Library Science, um, and they take all the core courses. And in addition to that, uh, from next uh, semester, from next intake onwards, they be actually taking four courses. When we, at least when we started the specialization, uh, the primary course that they take as a core for this specialization is the uh, diverse population, information and inclusion, and the universal usability course. Um, and the other two course, human rights and also information literacy and inclusion, were recently added. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these courses. So uh, the first course uh, is actually, I have uh, shortened it here as diverse population. It's called Diverse Population Inclusion and Information. By the way, I don't, I didn't, I don't have anything to do with coming up with the name of the courses. I don't know who it is. Um, so, but yeah, the courses are multiple. So the first course, um, actually, we uh, look at um, the framing of the study of information in the most inclusive possible, as the aspects that I mentioned just now. So what we do uh, every week, we talk about one or two aspects. So, so we talk about gender or race or uh, sexual orientation or language and we talk about what are the programs and services that are being offered out there for this type of population and what we can do more. So that's, that's primarily, uh, it's a very conceptual uh, class that we, we discuss all the frameworks that are involved. Uh, let's see, the second course, Human Rights, it's pretty new. I think we began offering this last semester, Information and Human Rights. So this course examines information as a human right, uh, including topics like relationship of information to human rights, social, cultural, economical, legal, and political forces shaping information rights. Uh, while this course is primarily is focused in what's happening in the United States, uh, good examples and bad examples are also drawn from international events for this course. Uh, the next course uh, is Information Literacy and Inclusion, and I believe this will be taught the very first time next semester. So this course actually involved um, looking at educational and psychological dimensions of helping and supporting new users to become information literate, and also experienced users, how do they sustain information literacy. And the last course here is Universal Usability, and that's the course that I teach. Um, so we basically talk about universal design, universal design for la learning, laws and standards for accessible technology design. It's a very hands-on class. Uh, it has involvement, uh, students actually go out to the field, actually work with libraries uh, to, to conceptualize, design and evaluate new technology or technology-focused service. Um, last semester, we actually uh, partnered with DC Public Library. Uh, they are here today. They were very, very welcoming to our students. Our students actually went uh, and did, I believe, five projects uh, in groups. One of the projects was they actually, uh, one, of the one of the groups worked with uh, DC Public Library. Uh, they had uh, videos where they needed to add caption, ASL caption. So our students actually sat in the AS ASL classes, actually learned how to do the caption, found solutions on the best technology and cheapest technology to do it, 
and actually did the captioning. So it was incredibly uh, useful for them and also the, um, the DC Public Library because our students, of course, work for free. So uh, it, was, it was a mutual um, um, benefit. Uh, there was a couple of other projects as well. Uh, some of our students actually went and evaluated the JAWS learning program, that uh, JAWS training program that they offer to uh, people who are uh, visu uh, visually disabled. And uh, I believe they evaluated the advanced training program and provided recommendations. So we do sort of this stuff in this class. Um, the diverse population class and universal usability class is very, very popular. Not because Paul Yeager and myself are teaching it, <laughs> but because of the content and the experiences that we give our students in that class. Uh, I checked yesterday and the universal usability class is already full. Normally we, do, we uh, have about 30 students in the class and sometimes we let a few other people slide by. I hope our associate dean of academic programs is not here. She's here. Okay. <laughs> So um, typically these courses are, uh, are filled up very quickly and that's because not just the MLS students take these courses but the MIM students which is the Masters in Information Management and the HCI students, Masters in Human Computer Interaction also take this course as their electives <coughs> and we like to have them in the classes because it actually uh, gives us the diversity in intellectual thoughts. They bring ideas on design, ideas on management, which is truly, truly valuable to our profession. One unique uh, thing that we do in this program is that uh, we actually um, uh, match our scholars, our IDP scholars, <coughs> with um, librarians. Uh, or pro uh, information professionals in the field. So uh, for the IMLS program, uh, we actually partnered with all these institutions here. Uh, we are very, very grateful to them because they actually provided their staff to mentor our students. And the way we actually did it is that we looked at the statements that our students submitted when they applied for this program. And our students have incredible interest, incredible passion towards serving diverse population. And we then approached the mentoring institutions and the mentoring institutions provided us a list of staff that are interested in mentoring. So then we did matchmaker.com and we matched them. Uh, we matched them. Of course, as you know, matchmaker.com, some matches are actually ma ma made in heaven and some are not. So we actually learned from this experience that some mentoring need to develop organically. Uh, some of our students found their perfect match. They you know, clicked immediately, shadowed their mentor and was just had an incredible experience. Uh, for those who didn't, we actually added, found them other mentors to work with and some actually found mentors on their own. But overall, I think this mentoring program was uh, useful especially for the students because they actually not only learn conceptually how to serve diverse population but was able to go into libraries, actually talk to the um, uh, uh, librarians on how they do it and in fact sometimes get to do it. So uh, I think I mentioned this briefly. Uh, the mentoring approach that we use is kind of threefold. Uh, we, uh, we encourage our mentors to provide this type of experiences to our students. The first one is, um, of course, day-to-day -day experiences. So whatever that they learn in class, they get to see what the uh, librarian does in the library. Uh, and also uh, cultural competencies, share with our students what are the skills, dispositions and knowledge needed to work with diverse population. And of course we want them to cultivate the next generation of librarians by providing career advice and we are also hoping that the IDP scholars will then be the next generation of mentors uh, for people, for upcoming students who are interested in working with diverse population. Um, and this is kind of sort of the waterfall mentoring model that we are pursuing. We created a mentoring handbook. Uh, it actually includes the roles and responsibilities uh, of mentors and the mentees. If you're interested in this, 
uh, we would be more than happy to share. And I'm also looking uh, for more uh, mentors and partners, <laughs> institutions who would like to donate their time. And also, if you have projects where our students can work, this is my pitch, come and see me after this. I always have students to work with you. Um, in addition to this, we also have a program where we meet the uh, IDP scholars every month. We do it the first Wednesday of every month. We just chose Wednesday because it was very convenient for everyone. Uh, in this brown bag lunches, we actually have professionals from the field, including researchers, coming and talking to our students about aspects of diversity. Uh, I believe Jonathan has been, uh, and he has uh, uh, talk, talked about you know, using screen readers. Some of them are very specific. We actually had uh, Dr. Renee Franklin Hill, who is actually a co-PI in this program. Uh, she just had a baby, so she couldn't come. Uh, she talked about cultural competencies. So we talked about several other things. And the nice thing is we also have some of the mentors come in and they talk about the mentoring process. So it exposes IDP scholars to other mentors as well. That is the IDP specialization in the MLS program in a nutshell. If you would like to get more information about this program, we are around here so you can ask us. So thank you. So we have about maybe two minutes to ask questions uh, to all of us. sharing that. Uh, by the way, I follow you all in, on Twitter. <laughs> it's a great program, I think. Awesome. Any other uh, comments or questions? Sandra. Thanks for that comment. I just went back through the Elise proceedings, which is the Association for Library Educators in 2002, and they kind of apparently done a program on this type of diversity. They talked about global. Um, this is for global possibilities, so this would be a good topic for an Elise conference so that all these programs can come together and talk about what they're doing and yeah. learn from each other. Yeah, I think Paul and I tried to put one sometime before and we got rejected. So <laughs> <laughs> kind of yeah, same thing that we were talking about last uh, last night, right? Yeah, but definitely it's a good idea. Maybe we should try again. <laughs> Thank you everyone. <laughs> <laughs>